Dear Seattle Kraken, On the 4th of December, 2018, the National Hockey League announced the location of the newest NHL team, sunny Seattle, Washington. As someone from the area, I am perfectly qualified to say how I am already not raising hopes for you. A lot of my predictions for sports come off a of precedent, and if there's one thing that all Seattle sports teams do, it's disappoint their fans with predictable, heartbreaking failure. To speak on this history of hurt, we need to go back to the beginning, because that's how long our sports teams have been a laughingstock. Our saga begins in 1967 with the creation of Seattle's NBA team, the Supersonics. It went as well as one could imagine for an expansion team. Even legend Bill Russell as coach can't help them deep into the playoffs. In 1969, the MLB awarded Seattle a baseball team called the Seattle Pilots. They lasted one year before they left for Wisconsin and became the Milwaukee Brewers. In 1976, the Seahawks joined the NFL. Then the following year, the MLB gave Seattle the Mariners to pick up where the Pilots left off, completing the All-American trifecta of basketball, football, and baseball. The Seahawks have a 12-loss season to start things off. They stink. The Mariners have themselves a 100-loss season. They stink. The Supersonics... Two, one, let the celebration begin and NBA champions. Turns out getting a new coach helped them deep into the playoffs, as they enacted revenge on the Washington Bullets after falling to them in the finals the year prior. They got to bring home a championship trophy just over a decade into their existence. Take a good look from the top. It's the only time it's gonna happen. It takes the Seahawks seven years to make it to the postseason. Oddly enough, their first trip to the playoffs almost took them to the Super Bowl. However, this is Seattle, we can't have anything nice. The Seahawks faced off in the AFC Championship game against divisional rival, the Oakland Los Angeles Raiders. Don't ask. The Seahawks beat the Raiders twice in the regular season and they hoped for a similar outcome. Quarterback Dave Krieg threw not one, not two, but three interceptions before being replaced with Jim Zorn who threw two of his own. The Seahawks defense couldn't handle much either, as eventual Super Bowl MVP Marcus Allen ran all over them to lead the Raiders to a 30-14 win over the hapless Seahawks. Soak it all in because this is the best the Seahawks will be for the next 20 years. We're skipping forward a decade, because nothing of value really happens. The year is 1994, and the Mariners were on their way to a disappointing season before the MLB players went on strike, which canceled the rest of the regular season and the playoffs. Not that the Mariners were going there anyway. The Supersonics, however, went on a tirade, 63 wins to only 19 losses. They are the one seed in the Western Conference playing the eight seed in the first round of the playoffs. No eight seed has ever beat a one seed, especially not a one seed that has dominated the year like the Sonics, and certainly not an eight seed like the sorry Denver Nuggets. Another three, way short. That's it, Macombo! Embraces the ball and the unlikely upset, one of the great upsets in NBA playoff history. The year is 1995. The Sonics shake that loss off with another loss in the first round. We're still not talking about the Seahawks, and the Mariners put together a pedestrian 79 and 66 record. But that's good enough for first in the division since the strike that canceled the 94 postseason also delayed the start of the 95 regular season. The Mariners battle past the Yankees in the ALDS and are four wins away from their first World Series appearance. They face off in the ALCS against the Cleveland- Oh my god! Dude, what the hell kind of logo is this? It doesn't help that the team is as good as their mascot is racist 
and that Cleveland team puts away the Mariners in five games. The year is 1996, and the Sonics storm back with the vengeance to go 64-18 and to once again sit atop the West. They breezed past the Sacramento Kings in the first round, swept the Houston Rockets in the semifinals, and sneaked by the Utah Jazz in the conference finals to make it to the NBA Finals for the first time since they won it in the 70s. There's only one thing that could stop the Sonics from nabbing their second trophy in franchise history. His name is Michael Jordan. Just like that, the magic was over. The Sonics would never make it to the NBA Finals ever again. The year is 2000, and with the start of a new millennium comes with it the same old agony from the end of the last one. The Seahawks finished underwater. The Sonics played well enough to get beat in the first round of the playoffs, and the Mariners put together their second 91 season in league history, behind a dominant roster capped off by hot stud out of Japan, Kazuhiro Sasaki, who won Rookie of the Year. They stomp on the White Sox to advance to the ALCS for just the second time. Unfortunately for the Mariners, it's against the New York Yankees. A slow roller, but Martinez doesn't run well. Jeter up with it. Start spreading the news. New York, New York. We also got to see Seattle Stadium, the Kingdome, do its best impression of the city sports to make way for more exciting venues for the teams to disappoint in. The year is 2001. The Supersonics went eh. The Seahawks left the AFC West to underperform in the NFC West. And the Mariners christened their new stadium by putting together one of the greatest seasons, not just in Seattle baseball, but all Major League Baseball. 116 wins out of 162 games. Hot stud out of Japan, Ichiro Suzuki won just about every award for his dominance. MVP, Rookie of the Year, and Golden Glove as the Mariners sat at the top of the entire league. There is electricity in the air. Seattle and the fans can feel it. This year would be their year to bring their fans home a trophy. Just 11 more wins to become world champions. The first hurdle, the Cleveland, ah geez, it's still there. The Mariners beat them and their racist mascot and advanced to the ALCS for just the third time. There's only one thing standing in the way of the Mariners advancing to their first World Series. <sighs> it's, it's the New York Yankees. Spencer, Yankees for the fourth year in a row have a date for the fall classic. 116 wins, and they couldn't even win four more. This is beyond pain. This is beyond heartbreak. We have now reached Sisyphus levels of tragedy. To this day, it remains the only 100-win season the Mariners have put together, and the last time the Mariners have been to the playoffs. The Mariners remain the only MLB team to never make it to a World Series, and the current holders of the longest postseason drought of any of the four major North American sports. The year is 2005. 
and the Seahawks have the greatest offense in the NFL, led by quarterback Matt Hasselbeck and MVP running back Sean Alexander. They go 13-3 with the trip to their first Super Bowl on the horizon for the first time in over 20 years. They get by the Carolina Panthers at home and have a date set with the Pittsburgh Steelers at Super Bowl 40. There's only one thing standing in the way of the Seahawks from becoming world champions. The referees. No Super Bowl had a referee crew that did a job as horrible as this one. Ben Roethlisberger's run was ruled a touchdown, even though the ball wasn't in the end zone. Hasselback's tackle following an interception return was ruled illegal, even though it was a perfectly legal tackle. There were penalties called on Seattle when they didn't commit one, and there were no penalties called on blatant penalties by the Steelers. Seahawks lose 21-10. The entire Seahawks team left the field wondering, what the hell just happened? Roethlisberger ended the day with the worst quarterback stats of any quarterback to win the Super Bowl because they were not supposed to win. <sighs> okay, maybe that's a bit harsh. The Seahawks may have been the underdog franchise, but the 05 Steelers were the underdog team. The Seahawks did choke in big moments, and the defense got fooled off that trick play, so maybe the Steelers still win, maybe they don't, who knows. But it helped their coach Bill Cowher get into the Hall of Fame, so whoop de doo The Sonics at this point have been struggling since they're running with the Bulls and find themselves in a playoff drought team owner Howard Schultz decides to sell the Sonics to a business group out of Oklahoma City. But don't worry, this group loves Seattle. Sure, Oklahoma City vied for a team ever since hosting the New Orleans Hornets after Hurricane Katrina. And sure, this business group has no connections in Seattle, but don't worry, they love Seattle. Look, here's star talent Kevin Durant with the second pick of the draft. He's going to be a problem for opposing teams, so surely they'll make the most out of him. And they take dead last in the league. Surprisingly, this is the first and only time they were actually this bad. That's the good news. The bad news? The year's 2008. And much like the stock market, Seattle sports are about to collapse in the most painful way possible. The Seahawks, who made it to the Super Bowl just three years prior, finished with the 12-loss season, their worst finish since the 90s. The Mariners become the first team paying their players a combined $100 million to lose 100 games. Oh, and the Supersonics, who just drafted future Hall of Famer Kevin Durant? They pick up everything and move to Oklahoma. Seattle gets backstabbed by the group we told them not to trust. It's like a climax in whatever the complete opposite of sex is. Not a drop of pleasure. 100% concentrated pain delivered to every inhabitant of Western Washington. With just two sports teams that people care about, and only one with any real vim and vigor behind them, the Seahawks need to make a big change. Seattle gets their big change by hiring coach Jim Mora. Playoffs? Don't talk about it. Playoffs? No, the other Jim Mora. Oh, 5 and 11, get out. Anyway, Seattle gets their big change by hiring coach Pete Carroll out of USC. College championship winning coach out of USC, mind you. He has experience coaching in the NFL too. Dan Marino's famous fake spike was thrown against Pete Carroll's Jets. Adam Vinatieri waltzing in for two after an untimed touchdown stunned the Bills. Those were Carroll's Patriots. Now Seattle has Pete Carroll's Seahawks, and he's better than 5-11. Look, 7-9. The Seahawks won their division with a losing record and then upset the reigning champion New Orleans Saints in the wildcard game. The Mariners only have losing records and wish they could make it to a wildcard game. 
The Seahawks drafted a young quarterback out of Wisconsin named Russell Wilson. The Mariners draft cannon fodder. The Seahawks built the Legion of Boom defense and an amazing receiving core and a ground game with a running back nicknamed Beast Mode. And Russell Wilson developed into a dual threat quarterback who could extend plays, scramble, pick up yards on the ground, or drop dimes downfield. They go 13-3 and host the NFC Championship for the first time in almost a decade against division rival San Francisco 49ers. The game shouldn't be this close because Seattle had careless turnovers. Luckily for them, so did the 49ers. The Seahawks led by six in the waning seconds of the game. The offense did their job giving them the lead, but now it's on the defense to keep it that way. The year is 2013. Super Bowl 48, Seattle's time to shine. The league's best defense in the Seattle Seahawks went up against the league's best offense in the Denver Broncos. Known only as the team that got screwed out of a chance to call themselves champions, the Seahawks come out with a chip the size of Peyton Manning's forehead on their shoulders. Speaking of shoulders, the first play of the game. It snapped over the head of Peyton Manning. A flag is down and the ball's out of the back of the end zone. The NFL's number one defense did their job, holding the Broncos to just one touchdown and picking off Manning twice. The Seahawks had an absolutely crazy scoring game, gaining points on the ground, in the air, a kick return for a touchdown, and a pick six by linebacker Malcolm Smith. If you've never seen or heard of this dude before, I don't blame you. He's the one who actually intercepted the pass in that championship game when Richard Sherman broke up the pass. Smith had 10 tackles in the Super Bowl, along with the fumble recovery and the pick six, which was deemed a good enough performance to win Super Bowl MVP. The Seahawks completely exposed Denver and league MVP Peyton Manning for a final score of 43-8. Seattle, for the first time since 1979, and for only the second time ever, has a reason to celebrate. They are the champions of the world. The following year, the Seahawks kept the train rolling with their potent offense and shutdown defense. They went 12-4 and, and took the top spot in the NFC. The Seahawks blew open the Carolina Panthers in the divisional round to host their second straight NFC Championship against the Green Bay Packers and league MVP Aaron Rodgers. Russell Wilson threw not one, not two, not three, but four interceptions but Seattle's defense kept Green Bay scoring to a minimum. The Seahawks got some points thanks to a fake field goal for a touchdown. Needing more points, the Seahawks needed to recover an onside kick, which went in their favor, and it turned into a beast mode touchdown. They also made this insane Hail Mary of a two-point conversion to take a three-point lead before the Packers kicked a field goal to send the game into overtime. Seattle won the coin toss, got the ball to start overtime, and looked to end it. After a great catch and run by Doug Baldwin, the Seahawks had first and ten, with 40 yards keeping them from the Super Bowl. The year is 2014. Wilson. We can celebrate here, but it's all about precedent, and throwing a bunch of interceptions in a championship game can't be a good omen, especially when you're looking to repeat Super Bowl titles. The Seahawks faced off against Tom Brady and the New England Patriots in Super Bowl 49. The last time these two teams met, Brady got shut down by the Legion of Boom and even threw two picks. Down six with a minute left. Russell Wilson found Sidney Rice for the touchdown to win by one point. 
This became known as the You Mad Bro game because defensive star Richard Sherman tweeted this picture with the caption, You Mad Bro? And of course he mad, he threw the ball right to you. Anyway, Seattle kept the Super Bowl close with their defense putting on the pressure, even picking off Brady twice. Jeremy Lane suffered a broken arm after this return, but it'll be fine, it's not an omen or anything. The Seahawks tied the game in the waning seconds of the first half with a pass to Chris Matthews. If you've never seen or heard of this dude before, I don't blame you. He's the one who recovered that onside kick in the championship game after Brandon Bostic blew his assignment. Matthews caught four passes in the Super Bowl for 109 yards, which is really good, especially for the fact that this is his only touchdown in the NFL. Seattle didn't allow New England to score at all in the third quarter, but the Patriots took the lead with two minutes to go, with Brady attacking the cornerback who replaced Jeremy Lane. Seattle got the ball with less than two minutes left in the game, and Russell Wilson lobbed it out for Jermaine Curse, who made an incredible circus catch. After a run on first down, the Seahawks had second down and goal from the one yard line. Now let me set the scene for you. They have a running back, nicknamed Beast Mode, in the backfield. And they have 30 seconds with one timeout to go one yard. I'm not going to say what happens next, so I'll just let Al Michaels do it for me. Play clock at five. Pass is intercepted at the goal line by Malcolm Butler. Unreal. Malcolm Butler, who almost made the phenomenal play. This Richard Sherman face speaks volumes. Not just to the work he and the rest of the defense put in, only to get a heartbreaking loss in return. It speaks to the hearts and souls of every Seattle sports fan. We live in agony. Some cities merely adopt mediocrity. We were born in it molded by it, our hearts hardened by goal line interception after goal line interception after goal line interception. This face represents anyone in a blue and green jersey silly enough to have hope. Once known only as the team that got screwed out of a chance to call themselves champions, they're now known as the team who screwed themselves out of a chance to call themselves a dynasty. You're probably wondering how the Seahawks have fared in the years following. Lost in the divisional round, lost in the divisional round, missed the playoffs, lost in the wild card round, lost in the divisional round, lost in the wild card round. It's painful watching the Seahawks try their hardest to crawl back to the top. You're probably wondering if the Mariners ever dug themselves out of the basement. Nope. They've been handed so much talent on that squad in their history and they went and broke our hearts with them. Name any Mariner with a jersey worth buying and the team couldn't make it to a World Series with them. The year is 2019 and the Mariners started out 23-3, leading the entire league. They had the wind at their backs, and they finished 68-94 at the bottom of their division, of course they did. The following year, COVID shortened the baseball season to just 60 games, with 16 teams going to the playoffs instead of the usual 10. The Mariners won just 27 games. Had they won 30, they would have made it to the postseason. But while the MLB decided whether or not to have a season cracking, you were given a name. We are proud to give you the Seattle Kraken. Kraken, this is the legacy of the town that founded you. This is the story of the heartbreak upon heartbreak with brief moments of triumph your fans experienced. Sure, Seattle has some trophies from their soccer team and WNBA team, but those games don't sell out arenas. Yours will. 
please try not to disappoint us. But we'll understand when you do. And we'll be behind you every step of the way. A lot of my predictions for sports come off a of precedent. And if there's one thing that all Seattle sports teams do, it's entertain. Even if you lose in the playoffs, you can still hold the league record for most pick sixes in a game. Or you can make your fans cheer so hard they cause a registered earthquake. Oh, look at this run! What a run! Marshawn Lynch! Still on his feet! Even if you can't make it out of your division, you can still have a pitcher throw a perfect game. It's the 2 2. He got him! 34 years! 119 games! It's finally happened! A perfect game by a Seattle Manor! It was done! Or let another one balk against you for a walk-off game winner. A balk is called! A balk is called! We don't expect great hockey from you. Just hockey. So, Seattle Kraken, no matter how you perform on the ice, we'll still give our hearts and souls to you. Because you're not just THE Kraken. You're OUR Kraken. Sincerely, Thesaurus Dinosaurus. P.S. Steve Ballmer, if you're watching this, please move the Clippers to Seattle. Los Angeles is a solid Lakers town. Always has been, always will be. Staples Center doesn't want them. They're not hanging any statues off the sides of the building for any Clippers players. Kawhi's Audi. He doesn't want his jersey hanging up there anyway. You have no ties to Los Angeles, just like how that Oklahoma City group didn't have any ties to Seattle. Seattle loves you, and Seattle loves basketball. We already fixed up the arena for the Kraken and the Storm, and we'll even let you dance while introducing the team during home games. I'll, I'll let you sleep on it.